And as a learning organization, the learning has not stopped. The learning will not stop. OK. The second uh, presumption is uh, this, that the schools at the moment, they might be doing good. They might be doing well. But there is a scope for the schools to become better. And that is why we are doing this program, because we are trying to understand the various issues and the problems and the challenges uh, that surround the schools and how these can be grappled with, how these can be managed at the level of the principal, who's the head teacher, and also at the level of the teachers, uh, the students, the parents, the community, and so on and so forth. So in this last session today, I'll be talking about effective schools. And I'll be talking about the characteristics of effective schools, even though if we look at the definition of effective schools, we find that it more or less focuses on the academic achievement of the students. It's more focused on the test scores. It is more focused on the uh, the, the mastery um, of learning and so on and so forth. And in a way, we can say that this is a bit skewed uh, uh, perspective because we don't just want that our students should excel in academics, should have uh, good scores, should achieve very well. But also the other dimension is which the schools need to promote and the schools promote that there has to be an overall improvement in personality. But the personality should be holistic and so on. But there is a, a dominant view which realizes, which feels, and which is uh, which which is uh, gaining grounds, which has gained grounds rather, and which feels that you know the effectivity of the schools centers more around the academic achievement. And whatever is being done to make schools better is, after all, an attempt to improve instruction. Because the main, main uh, core function of the schools is to impart uh, instruction and the mastery of certain uh, skills and competencies. So uh, uh, whatever is done, uh, you know, let's say the management uh, techniques or the uh, uh, other things which are there, these are all done towards a single purpose, which is that the teach students should excel and the teachers should be competent enough to make this happen. So even though we may not really believe in this a bit skewed definition of the purpose of schooling. But I think nevertheless, it's uh, it makes sense to be thinking of school as a place where certain knowledge, skills, and competencies are imparted and where uh, mastery learning also has to be there. The, the mastery of competencies and skills that we are talking about has to take place because, after all, uh imparting of knowledge and skills is a very important single function of the school i don't want to get into the debate anymore because we do understand that uh, school uh, has an important role in building an overall personality and overall holistic personality of the student so uh, let us now try to see that what exactly is meant by effective schooling. Uh, I will actually not get too much into what has been written in the unit, which is the 11th unit of the block, the last block, which is the third block. But I'll try to supplement and uh, bring in uh, certain more features, you know, which are outside the discussion of the unit, but which nevertheless enrich whatever has been given in the unit. Because I do feel that uh, this kind of a discussion will give you a much better understanding and a much broader understanding of effective schooling or what is meant by effective schools and how do we proceed towards that goal you know how how uh, how how do we set that goal 
and what is the way what is it that needs to be done what are the characteristics and what are the indicators of effective schooling which we have to remember both as uh, our in our role as head teachers at the same time uh, in our role as teachers also so let's start one by one and let me just take you to a few powerpoints uh, uh, which have been uh, made here can you hear me Yes, madam, I can hear you very well. All right, all right. Let me just uh, get this on board. If you can just give me a minute, you know, this will help me to. You're not able to see the PowerPoint slide, are you? No, no. Are you able to see the PowerPoint slides? No, ma. No, no, just, okay, just give me three, four minutes. I have kind of, I seem to have done something which I should not have done in terms of pressing a button or whatever. So I'll take about five minutes to... <laughs> okay. Uh, let me go back to the... See, the problem with technology is that, you know, you're not always sure as to what is going to happen and where it will lead you. Is it fine? Can you see the slide now? No, madam, there's no slice. Huh? You're not able to? Okay, now it is showing. It's showing. All right. Okay, so if you look at this slide here, we are talking basically about effective schools. Like I said, that there are certain characteristics and there are certain parameters that we need to keep in mind uh, when we are talking about effective schools. And I also have mentioned the fact that uh, effective schools, even uh, though uh, they signify somewhat a limited perspective, yet that perspective and that goal of schooling is something that we cannot, uh, uh, you know, lose sight of. So for us, it's very important that we try and understand our role in making our schools more effective. So what are the characteristics? The first is that there has to be a strong school leadership and planning. Again, here we are talking about the role of the head teacher because head teacher is the one who's the leader of the school. So how, uh, how well does he or she provide that leadership? Uh, how uh, is that leadership implemented in concrete actions? And how is the planning done towards achieving this goal of becoming a strong leader? That's very important. And I don't want to uh, discuss at this point too much. We will, when we get into detailed discussions, I think uh, the meanings will become clearer. Second thing is that the teachers have to be effective as well, which means that their teaching learning has to be up to the date, their teaching strategies, the pedagogy that they uh, use in their classrooms and the assessment and all they, that they adopt has to be effective. The teachers themselves have to be well qualified. They have to be update, not only in the content, not only in the knowledge of the content, but also in the uh, pedagogies and the ways of teaching that content. Positive school culture, uh, school culture, which is all the time emphasizing on the need for change, uh, a culture which encourages change, even though that change may uh, be just at the experimental stage. I want to try out this method of teaching. I'm not sure whether it's going to uh, fetch me good results, but nevertheless, I want to try it out. The fact that there is a change from what I have been using earlier, and now I want to use something which I think will be effective, uh, that kind of a climate in the uh, school is required, whereby teachers are free to... Uh, experiment with new methods. They are free to experiment with new classroom management techniques. 
uh, they are free to experiment with the ways that uh, you know they they will impart instruction the the ways they will assess if i want to give away uh, the method of uh, multiple choice questions and want to adopt something like a portfolio based assessment my school culture should enable me to try that out if i don't succeed okay all right but nevertheless i should feel that i have that space as a teacher where i can bring in experiments which i think will help the teaching learning process which will facilitate learning high quality curriculum curriculum again we are not talking about a list of topics but we are talking about the entire gamut of things which get into the curriculum which is basically the content that has been decided or the the, the actually the the content that we call out the content that we will teach at the school level most of the time this is all ready in the textbooks uh, which are there and which are prescribed for the specific classes but at the same time uh, high quality curriculum will also uh, mean that my pedagogy and teaching methods are sound they are effective they correspond to the needs of the learners similarly like i gave you an example the assessment also has to be there i also need to know why i am assessing how i'll communicate the results of the performance of the students how the assessment will help me to become more effective if my uh, it's the, the the scores show that my teaching is not very effective because majority of the learners may not have scored well performed well then probably uh, uh, i need to reflect on my teaching as well so high quality curriculum encompasses all these things it's not just about the textbook that we are teaching effective instruction already i have said that's uh, curriculum and instruction probably we can take it together now in this uh, situation where we are talking about uh, uh, effective schools uh, there are certain prioritizations and there are certain actions. Uh, let me talk about where I had begun. I had begun with the strong school leadership and planning. What does, uh, uh, what does this mean? What are the actions here that we are talking about? Otherwise, this will remain only in an abstract form. Here we are talk talking about the development of instructional leaders like principal, assistant principal, and counselors. And also, of course, the teacher leaders or the teacher mentors or the master uh, you know, trainers who, can, who, te uh, who also uh, interact with the other teachers and uh, in the faculty development programs and all, if the schools have that kind of a provision. So these should be with clear roles and responsibilities. I'll just talk a bit about the instructional leadership. You might have heard about this word, instructional leadership. At the same time, we also talk about what is known as uh, transformational leadership. Whereas uh, this, this particular term, transformational leadership, is much, much broader in its meaning and scope. The instructional leadership is just a part of it. What is instructional leadership? instructional leadership is uh, generally you know something which is defined as the uh, management of curriculum and instruction by the school principal this is basically uh, something which kind of you know uh, where uh, a situation where the principal works alongside the teachers to provide support and guidance in establishing best practices in teaching so we are talking about imparting of instruction where the uh, the school principal the head teacher is the leader who will work alongside with the teachers and uh, discuss and seek ways of uh, uh, improvement in uh, imparting instruction so instructional comes from the fact that it is about the imparting of instruction which is teaching and learning so how the curriculum has to be delivered how it has to be managed that kind of guidance has to be given by either the principal assistant principal counselors or the teachers who are at that level the other part of this is the focused plan development and regular monitoring of implementations and outcomes as you people are all aware 
and i think this is something which is you know happening now across the board we are talking about the school development plans school development plans have become a part and parcel of the planning of the school you know i mean school gets into uh, um, uh, drawing a road map which actually uh, indicates the changes that a school needs to make so in a nutshell we can say that the school development plan is a road map which uh, kind of propels the school towards going in the direction to achieve all those changes which uh, it is felt that it needs to make so those changes whether uh, that is uh, in uh, for improving the level of uh, student achievement if, if the, there is an indication that that needs to be done how will that be done uh, how these changes will be brought about all this kind of planning mainly coming from school plan uh, school development plan i should say because that's a very important tool of uh, bringing in changes in the school uh, uh, in the school setup that leads us to uh, actually not only laying down the sense of the, the the direction of the change but also how these changes will be implemented and after that evaluating the outcomes whether the outcomes have been in uh, consonance with the goals or the targets or the objectives that we had set out to achieve so uh, when we are talking about strong school leadership and planning we are talking about the school principal not only being an instructional leader but at the same time also laying down a plan to achieve those uh, goals in instruction uh, which need to be brought about the to make the school more effective so this is an important first feature of that the second thing is about the effective well supported teachers who why, why, who are these well supported teachers so it begins right from the recruitment stage the recruitment selection induction uh, is done with a set of people who are good in their subject discipline and also who have some kind of a uh, knowledge of the pedagogies and the teaching learning at the school level so uh, normally the schools insist on having well qualified uh, teachers once these are in then the task of the uh, school is to continuously build teacher capacity through observation and feedback cycles i think this in service training or in service capacity building is a very important part because even if you get very good teachers at the entry level if you recruit uh, well qualified teachers i think the responsibility of the school which nobody can uh, shy away from remains that periodic up, updation periodic capacity building has to be done through tools such as observation observe the classroom teaching of that particular teacher or set of teachers get feedback from various sources and then try to see estimate the need and the demand and then try to organize and plan uh, the uh, capacity building uh, workshops or capacity building uh, meetings or capacity building uh, training programs whatever it is but continuously this has to be done so after these two we go on to the positive school culture i already made a mention about it that uh, uh, it has to be uh, first of all the vision mission and goals which are very clearly defined now these days most of the schools have a very clear definition of their vision mission and goals uh these are independently designed for each school also but at the same time they have uh, alignment with the state objectives objectives of the government objectives of the country also you know so there is an alignment which is uh, which takes care of the needs of the society as well as the national needs you know so all these have to be aligned together and then uh, 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 that has to the vision and mission has to contain these elements and the curriculum also is aligned towards these goals which is the vision mission and the goals the, and the values so curriculum and these have to be in sync it cannot be uh, divorced it cannot be separate from the vision and mission of the school 
then uh, following the vision and the mission and goals, what are the uh, expectations uh, from the staff and the teachers? If we have to uh, fulfill these goals and uh, align our teaching and learning to the mission and the values, uh what what is it how are we supposed to do that what is the roadmap for that what is my teaching learning going how is it going to be how is it my assessment going to be what will be my classroom management which should facilitate the achievement of this one important thing we are talking about is a safe environment and as far as academic achievement is concerned we talk about high expectations the teachers have high expectations from the pupils the pupils have high expectations from themselves and the classroom environment is safe. It's not intimidating. Not only is, is it physically safe, but is, it's also mentally safe. The, 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 the respect uh, amongst the peer group and also from the teacher to the students and vice versa is maintained. High quality uh, curriculum, which is which follows all the principles of curriculum design and so for, so on and so forth and is put in a year long scope and sequence because that is the uh, one year tenure of an academic uh, session that we talk about so this has to be kept in mind uh, let's go on to the effective instruction outcome driven objective driven daily lesson plans with formative ass assessment we all know that our classroom assessments in whatever form we decide to construct them have to go almost on a daily basis uh, and uh, how creatively we design those and how suited they are to the learners need is very important we know that lesson plans are now being uh, synced with outcome based education what is the knowledge competencies and skills uh, that we want our learners to uh, acquire uh, by the time they graduate out of our schools or they graduate out of the particular class this is important effective classroom routines and instructional strategies data driven instruction let me just uh, spend two minutes over here i think what is data driven dis, uh, instruction is the fact that uh, if uh, I have to improve my instruction as a teacher. My instruction has to be based on certain uh, observations and feedbacks and certain kind of data arising out of the test scores of the, uh, of the uh, assessment, whether it is the formative or the uh, term and uh, examination or summative assessments. The data which comes out of that gives me a good feedback into improving my instruction. What does that mean? If I'm a maths teacher and I feel that nearly 70% of the class has not understood the concept of decimals or uh, place value, uh, then obviously there is something wrong with either the teaching method or my explanation of the concept or their understanding of the concept which they have derived from previous classes so when i have that data that there is 90 per 70 percent of the class not being able to do well with regard to certain concepts and so on and so forth i can work with the help of that data and try to improve my instruction so uh, this does not have to be elaborate in fact when we are evaluating the answer scripts and all we get a fairly good idea uh, about the concepts which have been understood well uh, by the students and those which still need to be understood. So those areas where there are still gaps, we have to then think of suitable action plan to fill that uh, gap. But uh, without the data, it might be quite uh, not possible for us because we will be just groping in the dark. So these days, more, more uh, uh, there is a thing stress more upon uh, improving your instruction with the help of the uh, achievement data which you have so that you can improve your uh, teaching learning methods just one last thing very fast so we can also then plan uh, uh, remedial teaching and instruction for the students with learning gaps when do we do that what time uh, is suitable for them and for us whether we should take the help of brighter students in the classroom or we can uh, request a junior teacher to do that for us or a senior student. These are things that you all need to plan for accordingly. 
uh, see uh, basically like i uh, started saying that the effective schools the at the core lies the fact that uh, apart from the fact that there is an emphasis on achievement there is also the fact that these are not teacher centered when we are saying effective schools we are involving the students more and more in the classroom discussions we are not saying that only the teacher will uh, you know have the monopoly and the teacher only will impart instruction so that we can uh, impart those skills and competencies which we have uh, designed for them no uh, the, the 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 children have to be more participative the classroom has to be more democratic uh, similarly when we are talking about the updation of the uh, or the capacity building of the teachers these teachers are then trained to use strategies which cater to different learning styles we know that uh, students learn through different ways this could be uh, learning more through visual things or auditory this thing or some read more through the the reading things and all but there are variety of ways and learning styles which the students have you know so our uh, uh, strategies have to be assigned uh, have to be aligned to the uh, the the learning styles of the students but am i being equipped adequately by my school uh to uh to uh, think about the these strategies or not if i am not then i think we have to impress upon the school to train us in for uh you know for uh, uh, uh devising strategies let's say for the visual learners for the auditory learners for uh, logical learning for intrapersonal learning for those who are you know more into language linguistic learning and for kinesthetic so all these uh, are uh, there we are recognizing that these are important learning styles of the students but we have to equip ourselves to uh, impart that with uh, appropriate uh, uh, teaching strategies also educators are equipped with knowledge and st uh, strategies to use positive behavior and management techniques uh, first thing which i said was these are not traditional disciplinary approaches we are talking here about more child centered our thinking is more aligned on the teacher centered approach but this has to be changed so that the schools become more effective the classrooms can become more effective uh, now what is the role which is being envisaged for the children over here uh, we are not only providing them with the knowledge and competencies but also the tools to become independent and make the right choices in the life in their lives through life skill education they are more involved in school management through democratic uh, ways and methods like for instance school councils and the last thing is about arts music and sports to keep the children connected to schools at the same time also to develop the other uh, aspects of their personality so this was in brief a bird's eye view of what is meant by effective schools i will move a little further and i will uh, get on to discussing about the classroom practices in the concept of let's uh, in, in the concept in the uh, in the con context of effective schools, what kind of classroom practices are we aiming at and what kind of uh, classroom uh, teaching learning strategies uh, should we emphasize as teachers? I think that's also very important. But let me take a pause over here before we move on to the next seg segment, which is about exploring effective classroom practices or effective pedagogy in the uh, in the context of the schools so if there are any questions please field your questions and then i think i'll move to the uh, next part any questions about uh, the the things that we have talked about so far in fact i have talked about i've been doing most of the talking uh one has uh, talked about effective schools and so on and in a way i have also highlighted the chief characteristics whether they are about uh, instructional leadership 
whether it's about um, you know classrooms which are more child centered it, or it is about the school doing the capacity building of the teachers to enable them to undertake uh, you know better teaching methods and so on and so forth so but then please ask me your questions some uh, brief canvas has been there you know for discussion okay madam. yeah yeah please yes yes madam so i want to ask so when we say effective school um school that have um school improve um, school development plan and school don't that do not have school development plan can they both be described as effective or since one doesn't have a development plan it is an ineffective school thank you yeah so that's a good question see basically uh, in recent years what has happened is that a lot of schools have moved towards uh, the direction of achieving efficiency in the tasks that they are supposed to render okay uh, i think uh, right in the beginning probably uh, there um, was a discussion i think i hope uh, you people are able to recall that where we talked about the fact that uh, what is happening is that the schools are becoming uh, very critical uh, in imparting teaching and learning and there is a lot of focus on how they perform that is because the society the individuals the community uh, is placing a lot of expectations of their on them as stakeholders what are uh, the stake uh, the expectations for instance that the students have the uh, expectations that we will get good jobs uh, parents also have similar expectations but they also feel that they will be transformed into good human beings the society looks upon the learners and the students as productive citizens who will take part in various processes of keeping uh, democracy alive. The nation also um, has similar expectations that there'll be a productive workforce, there'll be uh, uh, some kind of a, uh, this thing of knowledge and acquisition of knowledge and skills, which can add to the labor force or the labor market and so on and so forth, you know, variety of expectations. Now, what has happened because of these expectations, the school is being asked for accountability because it is being felt that especially in the context of public schools that a lot of money is going towards uh, keeping the schools going uh, uh, actually uh, the government money the public money uh, goes into the school for the infrastructure for the teachers their recruitment their salaries for the salaries etc of the non-teachers also so there are uh, issues of accountability and there are, have been debates about whether the state at all should fund the schooling or should the private players come into the picture so all, in the middle of all these debates the schools are being asked to give an account of their performance school development plan has been adopted by most of the schools because it's a tool to systematize their objectives for the coming year. It's a tool which kind of helps them to look into their shortcomings, into the gaps of their performance. It also helps them to look into the needs in terms of infrastructure, whether I need a library, whether I need a computer, whether I need a laboratory whether i require an english teacher who's well qualified for classes 11 and 12 should i have a contractual teacher and so on and so forth okay so most of the schools have adopted these tools because they are more and more accountable you have to show that this is what we did this is where we lacked and this is where we want to proceed in the forthcoming year in this school development plan there is also a, a membership of community uh, members from the civil society sometimes the parents sometimes the local uh, you know people who are more influential in matters in society and so on so it's supposed to be like a broad forum as a tool it does help and does serve 
useful purpose is because it systematizes our thinking in the school as a principal, as teachers, and so on and so forth. Makes us accountable, makes us more transparent. Schools which are not doing it, and schools were not doing it some time back, doesn't mean that they are disqualified. Now, if you look at the objectives, the objectives are clear. It's 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 about laying down a roadmap about uh, for the year 2024. What are my requirements? OK, is it building more classrooms because I have more students? Is it about uh, uh, having a fine arts teacher? because I don't have any? Is it about having more science teachers because many science teachers have left? Is it about building another wing to the school? These things can be done without the school development plan also. I'm not denying that these are things which need to over, uh, which need only, uh, which can only be done with the help of the tool, which is the school development plan. But I'm certainly saying one thing that this makes thinking more systematized, makes you more transparent in terms of, uh, you know, uh, answering to the society and to the government, and so on and so forth. In the absence of this, it's quite likely that because uh, there's no school development plan, I may not be able to do things under proper headings, under proper uh, matrices, and so on and so forth. But having said that, the absence of this tool might make my thinking more systematized, but it may not also deprived me of deprive me of thinking systematically, right? So school effectiveness has to be a goal. It's not dependent entirely on whether you have a school development plan or not. But that's just a tool to help us achieve effectiveness in a more uh, logical manner, in a more systematic manner. OK, so uh, James, I hope I've been able to answer your question. Can you hear me, James? Peter, have you been uh, able to hear me? Have you been able to hear the answer? <laughs> All right. So is anybody going to answer on what I have just now said about the school development plan? Or should I just move and presume that you are OK with the answer? Madam, please continue. What is the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, James, have you been able to, uh, I mean, am I able to make you understand what do I think about the school development plan? And are you OK with the uh, reasons that I gave or whatever I have answered? Yes, I am. In fact, we have an experience in my school about school development plan recently. So, All right. What was the experience? Was the experience? Let's hear that. Yeah, we are using the Managing for Learning approach to also develop. We used it, like, I think, last year, last two years, 2021 December, to develop a school. Sorry, one minute, Ned. Can you speak a bit louder because your voice is breaking? OK, madam. Please, can you hear me? OK, so I am saying that in 20, November 2021, we used the Managing for Learning approach to develop a school development plan or also known as school improvement plan in those in the, in that approach what we did was that stakeholders were were met so various stakeholders um the parents students teachers old student association people from the min and the ministry of education the district education office the chiefs and elders from the community uh, they came together to draw the school improvement plan they first identify the problems we have in the school and where they want us to go. So from the side of the parents, from the side of the teachers, and after that, we bring all of them together using the pairwise ranking to see the ones that is urgent. Then afterwards, we were able to select the three objectives, and then we created a mission and vision for the school 
we recreated a mission and vision for the school to have an immediate impact. So I really understand what you were saying based on this experience that I have. Uh, yeah, that's it's interesting. And I think uh, overall it does help us to align with the vision and mission and the goals of the school. They will always remain in front. And uh, as a tool, I think it does help us to kind of, you know, talk about uh, our uh, priorities and so on and so forth. You know, what is it that we... So uh, I think that's the advantage. OK, so now uh, let me move a, a, a bit uh, ahead. Uh, here I'll be talking about the key classroom uh, the organization of the classroom or the practices, the key uh, practices in the classroom, key classroom practices, which uh, help in uh, making the school more effective. So there have been uh, various kind of uh, uh, researches, you know, which have been gone, which are going, which have been uh, conducted in this area just to find out uh, whether uh, the school, uh, what kind of schools have uh, 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 classroom uh, practices which help them become more effective? And what exactly is their relationship with schools which are not so effective and which we can say uh, for our understanding which are, that those schools are a bit poor in their performance and all that. See, the main thing is that the teachers in excellent schools were rated very high on their organizational skills. Now, why, why was it uh, felt that, you know, why were they rated high? What is it that they did specifically which made their rating high? Uh, they had resources which were prepared ahead of time. Whatever the resource was, which was to be used in the classroom, the preparation was done beforehand, you know, much ahead of the timing when the class was to be held. Their lessons were well prepared and they were suited and tailored to the needs of the pupils. I did talk about the learning style. So these teachers probably had a good idea about the learning styles of their learners and they had tailored their instruction accordingly. So there were certain things like, you know, um, for the visual uh, students who were uh, learners uh, through the visualizing uh, certain things. Then there were the auditory learners that I talked about. And also these uh, teachers had a good idea about the learning styles of their uh, students. Uh, they, they also gave emphasis on the fact that we need to prepare our lessons beforehand. And for that, it is important to do some kind of a uh, uh, survey on the needs of the learners. Uh, individual needs of the learners were uh, kept in mind and lesson plans were made accordingly. The use of resources also was done accordingly. So there was a use of charts and video clips and uh, audio uh, clips and so on and so forth, you know, in that. Uh, whereas when we talk about the schools which were not so effective, there we find that um, the, the teacher's resources did not match the needs of the learners. And uh, where, whereas this is exactly in opposition to what was done for the effective schools, the teacher had already spent time in trying to understand the individual needs of their pupils, and they had uh, fitted their lessons uh, and tailored them to the needs of the individual pupils. The poor, the schools which were poor in this rating, which were not found to be so effective, here we find that they did not even think of the time of instruction or the instructional time uh, as a very valuable resource. That is, that if my instructional time for the class is uh, one hour, then I need to plan uh, a bit uh, meticulously about how productively I will use this time of one hour, whether I will have an interaction with the students, whether I will be the, uh, the one giving the lecture, only the lecture. Will I also have an assessment? 
will it help my teaching objectives for that instructional time and so on so the uh, the schools who did not perform well the teachers did not have any um idea or they did not uh, have a seriousness of purpose for the instructional time uh, secondly the management of the classroom routine was also poor it was not very effective and the interesting uh, thing was that uh, the students were not independent and self-reliant now you can ask me that what does it mean when we say that students are independent and uh, self-reliant you know i mean uh, what exactly do we mean by this because when should we start thinking that the children will become independent and self-reliant what is the particular age that we should be talking about if we talking we are talking about independent children so can you just give me an idea about that what is meant by independent and self-reliant children peter will you uh, give your thoughts on this particular thing about children uh, being self-reliant and independent in a classroom, school classroom. Can you just share your thoughts on this particular thing? So, Peter, are you there? James, can I have your thoughts on this? Madam, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Madam, please, sorry, can you repeat your question? My, my question is that we uh, see when we talk about a particular type of teaching learning, which is more child centered, you know, we say that uh, the aim of education is to make children independent and self reliant. Aim of education, not after they pass out, but even in the classroom they are supposed to take charge of their education they are supposed to take charge of their teaching learning so what exactly do we mean by the statement that we want to make children independent and self-reliant in the teaching learning process all right so madam uh, we are trying to say that when we say that making students independent it means that they are going to take charge of their own learning that we teachers and um, school leaders becomes facilitators. We guide them so that they construct their own knowledge, their own concepts and understanding. Now, you see, um, it does also mean that when you give the students the chance to create their own learning and, and knowledge, you give them the authority, the freedom to be able to express themselves. Unlike the traditional way or the old days of teaching where teachers go to class, define everything, do everything for the student, and when a child go home, he says, what, what did you teach? And say, they taught us this. But now when a child go home, he, he, she will say that I learned this. The change in English alone will, t will tell you that now there is inclusivity. The child is included in the teaching and learning process. The child is the leader of the teaching and learning process. And to me, that is how I really I understand that getting the children to take charge of their classroom or to take charge of the teaching and learning process. Uh, well, yes, I think you're quite on the mark, but I just want to add a couple of things. Uh, see, the point is this also that uh, when children are in school, uh, we cannot actually uh, think of a particular age, you know, when we can say that they have become independent and self-reliant. With every class, uh, what we have to do is that we have to sit back and guide learning. They cannot be fully independent. They will always need the guidance of the teacher. But at the same time, the teacher has to adopt, like what you are saying, has to adopt ways and means where they are given much more of an autonomy and control over the teaching learning process by even asking them that, you know, I mean, what is a topic that they would want to discuss if I'm teaching a particular topic? So a theme related to that topic can be discussed. How would you like to do it? Will you like to do it in a group or in individual, uh, this thing or whatever? So uh, this, in a way, gives uh, the children, uh, their, their self-esteem is enhanced. They feel that, you know, they are controlling their own learning and they feel happy uh, that they are able to do things of their own. So the independence comes from the self-esteem, but it's not total independence because the teacher always is there to scaffold learning 
or the teacher is always there to guide learning. For this, there are certain other things which have to be kept in mind. The management of the classroom has to be done in a particular manner that the children are not intimidated by the, the teacher. The teacher is approving of uh, the ways uh, that uh, you know they suggest. Um, uh, the teacher kind of you know doesn't pull them down or does not damage their self-esteem and they feel free to express their views. Uh, so within the overall guidance of the teacher, the learners become uh, self-independent and reliant. You know, that is important and that is a goal of learning. So in effective schools, we find that independence and reliance of the pupils is much higher as compared to the schools which were uh, not doing so well. Uh, uh, then the next thing is that the teacher also in effective schools uh, ensures that the, their, the objectives or the outcomes are shared uh, with the students. You know, they uh, the concepts and the, the ideas that they present in the lessons, they make sure that they are understood by all the children. Uh, when they, uh, if they check, in the classroom only through a discussion or with the help of question answer if they feel that the the a chunk or a group of learners is uh, still lacking uh, in the understanding of that particular idea or a concept uh, and they feel that they need to change the strategy of the of teaching that particular sentence they don't shy away from that if anything they find during the classroom not proceeding in the manner of uh, achieving the goals that have been uh, thought of they will not hesitate to change those uh, the teaching methods there and they will make sure that each and every child is able to understand you know i uh, this might be a bit difficult uh, 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 to begin with because you know it's not very easy and it is time consuming but if you do a class in which like you know very randomly you are asking the learners whether they are able to understand or not and if you have written the learning objectives on the board then the uh, the the intention the learning intention uh, of the activity and the lesson is very clearly put on the blackboard and the children also understand that this is what they are expected to be focusing on so <coughs> So with the help of whatever has been outlined beforehand, the uh, uh, a quick kind of a uh, feedback is taken from the students. The teacher is smart enough to realize that some students are still not understanding. So the teacher midway can also change the strategy or uh, or 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 try to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, make uh, whether it is making the thing simpler or giving more illustrations or doing it with the help of other children who understood it. This is for the teacher to decide. But, but then uh, there is a kind of a focus on uh, on 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 everybody trying to everybody uh, uh, achieving uh, what they have to achieve and the pupils being clear about it and also the teachers being uh, clear about it. In contrast, the learning uh, concepts and the ideas which are uh, used in the schools which are rated as poor, uh, 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 what happens over there? The teachers are slower in checking and correcting pupils' understanding of key concepts. Like they are not bothered. They, they do not want to understand and know uh, or they do not have the ways and means to understand whether the uh, concepts or ideas are being understood or not. The, the children may not be aware of their lesson objectives in the classroom, but the teacher has no idea whether they have fully understood. If they have not fully understood how to achieve uh, the objectives for the students, and they are also not as much motivated to meet these goals. So I'm just trying to bring in the contrast between the classroom practices, which 
uh, are in uh, uh, which are being followed in effective schools and not so effective schools because a lot depends in how the teacher is setting the agenda in the classroom so uh, let's go to the next thing which is about the homework uh, now what happens is that research also shows up that uh, the teachers in excellent and good schools they set homework which is much more meaningful to them and which is very clearly linked to what the children are learning so when they go back home and uh, what what normally is then done is that uh, the objective is here to deepen the children's understanding or whatever concepts are being in the taught in the classroom so they could have give homeworks which could uh, kind of you know align the teaching in the class with authentic situations outside so that the uh, teaching in the classroom is linked with the outside world or they could give other uh, assignments which help the children to actually recall and make things clearer which have been done in the classroom but in contrast to the effective schools the homeworks which are given there they are not necessarily linked to what is taught in the classroom and there is also uh, no flexibility given in effective schools the teachers also give flexibility like for instance they could give a variety of tasks you could do a project you could do a essay you could do a group project or you could do an individual thing also but this is much more uh, and uh, uh, this is not followed in the less effective schools the classroom uh, climate uh, is uh, excellent in the effective schools the good the good schools children they feel that they are liked and respected by their peers and also by the teachers whereas what happens in the not so effective schools the children feel that they the the teachers are more disapproving of them they feel that they dislike them there are more uh, reprimands there are more disciplinary issues which uh, come up there because what uh, what is being done over there is that uh, the children over a period of time become less sociable they become less cooperative because of the attitude or because of the classroom climate which is there which uh, through the teachers which uh, kind of displays more negatively you know the teachers are more uh, negative the classroom climate becomes negative the children become negative so this is totally in contrast to effective schools where the overall feeling in the classroom once the student comes to school is that uh, this is a nice place this is a healthy place to be in here my teacher likes me and my other fellow pupils like me they are happy they cooperate with me and we do meaningful things together which we enjoy so this uh, classroom climate also plays a role in uh, classroom practices that one has been talking about let's talk about the behavior management now uh, in uh, effective school the behavior is less disruptive and the children need not undergo uh, disciplinary disciplinary drills they they become uh, uh, they become disciplined with the polite correct and firm uh, behavior guidelines you, you know which are uh, given by the uh, teachers and the teachers necessarily do not give them nasty or ugly things uh, punishments to make them more disciplined but even use humor to make them a bit more disciplined and there are pointers in the humor for the children to pick up that look these limits will have to be followed at all times and these need not be crossed what happens in the uh, not so effective schools that uh, the behavior of the teacher uh, the the students is much more disruptive there are frequent uh, need there is a frequent need to discipline the students and uh, sometimes the discipline kind of involves threats it involves personal attacks it involves uh, belittling the children or shaming the children the level of chaos is much higher the the teachers are praised for having 
rolled over the students because the, uh, controlling the children's behavior, making them disciplined becomes the dominant kind of preoccupation. So the teaching learning process takes a backseat. The focus on instruction, therefore, for it to become meaningful, child-centered, effective, that takes a, 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 a back foot or a uh, it gets into the background, you know. So these kind of contrasts actually uh, very clearly make us see the, the practices which are in uh, excellent schools, effective schools, and not so effective schools. One or two more points which I want to talk uh, with you about are uh, the, the, the collaborative learning which is uh, uh, followed, you know. Uh, situation, uh, uh, this is a situation where uh, children uh, spend time in groups, uh, whether in co-curricular activities or in curricular activities. See, uh, these days one need not distinguish between the co-curricular and curricular because even the curricular is supposed to have a fair amount of teaching learning present in there. In fact, when we talk about drama, role play, uh, uh, or, or storytelling, or uh, doing things through puppetry and all that, we know that teaching learning is... Uh, present and can be transacted through this. So uh, th the learning that I'm talking about could be in any of the domains. It could be something like doing a project. It could be participating in a drama. It could also be doing a role play and so on and so forth. So these kind of collaborative activities are much more. And the overall time spent on these activities is much more as in ineffective schools as compared to children who come from uh, not so effective schools. I'm not saying poor schools, but I'm, I, I'm not saying poor and not making a judgment at the point at, at present, because I do feel that uh, the, the poor performing schools probably also have a scope to improve. So if we look at them as schools who are making efforts or who are likely to make efforts or who are making efforts, but not efforts enough, you know, strongly, they are moving in that direction. So while our goal may be to become an effective school, but the goal certainly cannot be to remain poor forever. So that poor image has to also undergo a transformation. So I have categorized them as effective schools and not so effective schools. Uh, let's, let's get into another important link, which is personalized teaching and learning. Uh, like I said before also, the teachers here are more sensitive to the individual needs of the learners, which also means that they have uh, some kind of uh, idea about their uh, socioeconomic status, their uh, learning styles, and so on and so forth. And uh, also the fact that some students might be coming from very far off places, some come from very low income background, some come from, uh, you know, uh, such segments which are kind of, you know, beyond, beyond the main, which are at the periphery of society and so on and so forth. Some come from uh, single uh, parent kind of homes. So there is there's a whole heterogeneity which is present out there in the classroom. So a sensitive teacher is more or less likely to have some idea about the backgrounds of the children. And this background uh, means that there is also the thing about their uh, learning styles and uh, so on, you know. So uh, they are attached in that sense they to the students. They have information about the students. And uh, they, they therefore, uh, they while being exceptionally sensitive to the needs of the children, they also modify their learning materials. They also spend time. They also have expectations, uh, which are kind of you know reinforced through the friendly approach. They don't put pressure on the students, uh, and th that is the kind of uh, links that I'm talking about. That's the kind of uh, personalization of teaching learning that I am talking about. Now, this uh, this, however, needless to say that this is in cont uh, contrast with what is being done in not so effective schools. Uh, then uh, 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 the, 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 the teachers make it very clear their likes and dislikes. They like their students. They give them a lot of uh, uh, scope for self 
increasing their self esteem and so on and so forth which is again very very important factor there their assessment for learning the view of teachers in effective schools is that while assessment gives them a feedback about uh, how their children have scored it also gives that scope where as they can give better opportunities for the pupils to reflect on their learning the teachers try to reflect on the pupils achievement and also on their own practices which they follow and modify themselves so assessment becomes an important tool for uh, them you know i was also talk talking about data based instruction you know so i mean that assessment is a valuable tool also standardized assessments uh, which are given you know during the whole uh, year and then finally of course the summative will not help so much in the feedback but it can of course help for the next year you know for the students which uh, come in um, so by and large uh, one can say that providing a positive classroom climate having good organizational skills in the classroom uh which means basically uh, making use of the instructional time planning their lessons adequately and well uh, organizing their materials around the needs of the learners and so on this uh, having a sense of uh, a, a democratic kind of a space to the children not intimidating them not reprimanding them having a personalized and interactive approach this is something which is very important and which is followed uh, by uh, the effective schools so uh, i would say that uh, uh, you know uh, research backs that these kind of practices if they are followed will be received very highly and which will they will go a long way in making the school effective and like i had said in the beginning because effective schools put a lot of premium on the academic achievement therefore classroom practices become also very very important so i'll just take a pause here and i will just uh, kind of you know invite questions like james has been a constant there and now uh, we can see uh, suleiman also having joined in uh, so is there anything that you would uh, like to ask Suleiman after the whatever you've kind of picked up from this? No, ma'am. No? So uh, James, can is there any anything that... Uh... No, ma'am. Ma please continue. One more thing which I would like to say is that there is also, uh, yeah, one minute, James. Uh, there's also an element of what is known as dialogic teaching learning, you know, where uh, teaching learning takes place through a conversation. It is not teacher centered, it's not focused only on the students, it is not uh, focused only on the, uh, the, the teacher or the student approach, but it's a kind of a exchange and interaction, a kind of, uh, you know, like uh, a, a discussion an exchange of notes and so on and so forth so that is also one of the important things um dialogic teaching uh is basically uh you know used in uh maths discussions where there is logic you know so such subjects have more of the dialogic uh teaching so that's uh, what I wanted to add to what I had said earlier. So would you like to say something, James? Yes, madam. Now, I initially, I didn't want to say anything, but since you brought in the... Now, I just have to ask a question. How is that one different from the democratic one? The dialogue. How is it different from the democratic... How is the dialogue classroom situation different from the democratic classroom situation? All right. Okay. So there are, uh, uh, let me say, let me first try to uh, uh, get on to working a, de a definition of democracy. Okay. Why is that important? Because we are using particularly the concept of democracy, right? So what is the democracy uh, concept of democracy? It implies three or four things, right? A, it applies everybody is equal. Second, it 
uh, implies that everybody is empowered. Thirdly, it uh, irrespective of their background, whether they come from whatever social strata or they come from uh, whatever economic background and all that. Okay. And it is empowering space. It is an equal space. It's a free space and so on and so forth. You know, mostly democratic uh, space, in a way, if we're trying to understand the concept of democracy, which our own nations uh, have, you know, our own countries, it is, it is in a way derived from that. Uh, when I'm a teacher in classroom, and then what happens is that there are no hierarchies. When we are presuming that there's an equality, then I cannot just be the teacher only, right? Then uh, Suleiman, Ibrahim, and me, we stand at a position where we are more or less equal, OK? Even if there is an exchange of knowledge going on, but apart from that transaction which is going on, there is nothing like my being on a very high pedestal or me my being talking down on you or my not being able to take into account the fact about your backgrounds as teachers or other things you know so we are uh, equal i am a facilitator and i will involve whether there are five students or ten students into the process i will not do things which are intimidating because i have the power right now as a teacher i can do that i can say oh why why this, is is this happening why is it that so few students are coming you know uh, to attend this and uh, without trying to understand the reasons for why they are not um, coming and attending and try to take it out on something like a teacher has so many things where you know the teacher can uh you know prove that she is in a position of power whether it is assessments whether it is classroom behavior and all when i'm not doing all that when i am more or less guiding your learning when i am trying to uh, involve you into this process where i understand as much as you understand uh, we understand for from each other where i respect your positions as people who come to the class to my class with knowledge and understanding because they are practitioners they teach in schools and they have a fair amount of knowledge by way of their practice uh, then and when i'm not uh, calling out names when i'm somebody who's not who you are not scared of who you feel that you know respects us in our position and in our contribution then i am i empower also i feel that you know you will be empowered when you go back to your work positions and so on and so forth because you will carry some knowledge competencies and skills and try them out and you would have gone on a position a bit higher because of all those uh, gains and so on so democratic classroom in a nut nutshell is a classroom which is safe where my classroom management practice is such that i will not discriminate i will have no bias i will not make a distinction between somebody coming from a well-off background somebody coming from a socially uh, 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 upper uh, strata between a male and a female between somebody who doesn't have experience and who has experience by and large my students are equal by and large i am not in a very hierarchical position but i am a facilitator i am a guide with that approach okay when i uh, go into my classroom with my students i am democratic then i will not feel angry if you kind of stop me to say something which you want to say on a particular topic otherwise there are teachers who say don't disrupt don't interrupt why are you doing this? You are creating uh, indiscipline. You talk too much. You ask too many questions. But here again, I'm not saying that this has to lead to indiscipline. No. But disciplining has to be in a way that the entire uh, classroom uh, interaction becomes such that you uh, contribute positively to the understanding of the concepts and so on and so forth. So that is the difference between uh, being democratic everybody is equal everybody participates 
no biases the teacher is not not showing any kind of a hierarchy or a power and so on and so forth so more which is difficult when we were growing up our teachers were hierarchical we were shown the our place we were told to shut up we were not exactly in that sense but there were students who wanted to ask uh, but then uh, they were not allowed because it was thought that classroom interaction uh, if it allows too many questions then it is a waste of time the job of the teacher is to come and transmit that knowledge the teacher is all, contains all the knowledge the students do not don't allow the students to uh, become too uh, outspoken do not in a way if you see this is also what you what parenting used to be like earlier times you know where the head of the family the patriarch will not allow the children uh, to make uh, indiscipline to speak too much and so on in traditional society at least this used to be the trend you know so uh, things have changed uh, parents are changing and so are teachers teachers more so because it's a requirement now because now children come from socially marginalized backgrounds uh, economically poor sections of society education is a matter of right you have to impart to everybody so you have to in that sense shed your uh, biases and your prejudices and so on and so forth and make everybody acquire the knowledge skills and the competencies that you have designed it's not designed only for a few so that's how uh, one looks at democracy it is setting up the classroom uh, atmosphere or environment or climate through such management practices which uh remove fear from the minds of the students which enables them to uh participate in a positive manner acquire more self esteem and acquire gain more knowledge and competencies so is that clear yes please all right so while i am saying all this i also know that it's very difficult to kind of you know uh do this because our prejudices we carry uh, and many a times we also say that we are not prejudiced but that's not true because in society our socializing has been like that that uh, uh, the ones who come from low literacy families children who will come from families where you know there is uh, alcoholism uh, prevalent and who are not so children are not so fortunate as to um, you know have uh, Uh, both parents staying uh, there and uh, and all that i mean they have, our prejudices have developed over so many years you know and uh, many a times we are not even aware we feel that no we are not prejudiced anymore we carry no biases but it's not true we haven't examined ourselves we do not visit ourselves we do not reflect on uh, you know uh, there are there are prejudices with regard to color uh with there are prejudices with regard to the language i mean um, all the time my children who come from uh english speaking families are given uh, prevalence by the teachers many a times the uh, teachers feel that students who come from first generation learners family cannot learn we know that that's a prejudice also because that's not backed up by any research so apart from our social uh, uh, prejudices uh, you know which we carry we also find that unknowingly those social prejudices play out in our teaching you know in more subtle ways now we are uh, it's not very obvious but there is a subtlety to it but uh, unless and until we examine our own uh, uh, prejudices you know it will become very very difficult for us to do anything about those prejudices so uh, do you actually agree with uh, with it or you don't agree with this that uh, you know we we are prejudiced and uh, we kind of you know are uh, very equal towards everything and equal towards everybody and all that what is your take on this as t teachers do you we we set up a democratic classroom do you think that you have overcome your biases 
or you feel that there is still a lot to be done personally personally i think that i have been um, able to make my classroom a democratic one but the teachers we in general some of our colleagues are not there yet especially um, due to disciplinary issues that are different in every school situation so um, one school might be there as in making the classroom democratic enough but then other school might not be because of the situations that can be found there especially especially because of discipline issues yes yes so uh, that's quite interesting to know and actually the if you see the origin of the sense of discipline also comes from uh, some kind of presumptions you know which we have about how children should be uh, uh, you know how can uh, right. how they how, yeah how they can be uh, made to behave we we do feel at times many of us do that that uh, uh, that you know it is our duty as teachers and parents to make our children well behaved and if they are not behaved and if they do not understand us then there is something very wrong with uh, uh, with us and we have to scare them we have to make them feel afraid and only after that they will not re, uh, they will not uh, repeat that behavior you know that feeling is also very strong with some people some people feel that schools are meant for disciplining so the notions of schooling the notion of behavior what is good behavior what is bad behavior asking questions is that good behavior or is that disruption are children uh, being disruptive or they are not being uh, disruptive all these kind of things uh, also kind of you know determine our practice as a teacher in the school so we have to i think constantly keep reflecting on our practices and then uh, see that how 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 the space in the classroom can be made much more meaningful can be made uh, uh, more safe can be made made more interesting and um, motivating for the children i think that is something you know which we have to constantly keep uh, doing to ourselves so suleiman will you like to also share your experience in this matter will you like to uh, suleiman can you hear me yes ma i can hear you Yeah, please share your experience i'm sure that you also have many experiences of a similar kind so interesting no experience ma no more experience so no more experience why are you are you teaching yes i am but not for a long time all right so okay then uh, when you were a student was your yeah. uh, teacher somebody who would want to make you feel disciplined or did you find that you know in your school the uh, the the behavior of the teachers is not equal in the classroom they prefer some students and they do not prefer some was there any kind because you know these kind of uh, experiences from our childhood if we have uh, uh had such experiences they stay with us for a very long time we are not able to get out of that you know because it, it, it those it, the impressionistic years we carry these impressions uh, mostly through the rest of our lives because it hurts at that age so let's hear some of that from you actually ma i have uh, nothing to say about that because Uh, i have no experience honestly so uh, i think i will be just uh, wrapping up in uh, in a short time but uh, before that i will just again try to uh, in a way you know wrap up the uh the 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 discussion in the first course uh here uh like i said before we are, have been talking about has head teachers as school leaders so the entire focus of the program has been on 
uh, how the teachers can head teachers or the principals or the vice principals can lead the schools you know so when we are talking about leading the school then leading the school where what is the goal uh, i mean uh, what are we talking about of course every principal might be feeling that he or she is leading the school she spends so much time at school looks at the various issues and so on and so forth which come in the school you know during the course of the uh, everyday functioning of the school but um, what are the broad categories or what are the broad objectives that we have in mind and uh, how can we uh, move in that direction what are the uh, implementations there or what are the activities or what are the actions which will help the head teachers uh, to uh, go in the direction of making the school effective and uh, like in the beginning i said that uh, i will broad based the definition of effectiveness i will not really confine it only to academic achievement we'll be talking we are talking about holistic development of the students here okay so uh, the first thing which needs to be done is that the schools need to have a very clear school mission you know unless there is a clarity in uh, the uh, within the school as to what it wants to achieve uh, i think uh, the the direction cannot be determined so uh, effective schools normally what do they do is that uh, they are correlated with student success so that is the uh, basic mission of the school also that uh, all children whether they are male female rich or poor black or white they will learn at least the essential knowledge concepts and skills needed so they can be uh, successful in the next year and overall they can be successful in society uh, and in whatever they do so basic uh, focus has to be on the uh, acquisition of the essential knowledge skills and concepts for them to move on in life you know so academic excellence it becomes one of the uh, major objectives of the uh, school which is translated into the uh, school mission clarity of school mission embodies this uh, achievement factor also and this is then shared amongst all the teachers what is shared amongst all the teachers it's not like this that what is sharing how is it shared what is it done that 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 through you know it is articulated through meetings and so on and so forth that the school has uh, a commitment to instructional goals priorities assessment procedures and accountability this is something which is very clear uh, clearly uh, articulated and shared amongst the teachers and the principals that look this school stands for academic excellence and therefore your commitment to instructional goals priorities assessment uh, procedures has to be there to achieve academic success at the same time you are also accountable how are you accountable you are accountable if you do not achieve the academic objective which has been stated so uh, teachers uh, then therefore have to take into account the low level academic uh, 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 children with the low level academic skills and also children with the higher level academic uh, cognitive abilities and make them realize this close uh, the the goal the, the principal however works hard to create this common vision and build effective uh, indicators to achieve this particular uh, vision and there is also a commitment to task uh, ensured by uh, provisions such as accountability and so on and so forth and the main binding factor is that uh, high, uh, the, 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 all the students can obtain mastery of school's essential curriculum 
by the hard work and commitment of the teachers. So basically, uh, the, the, the teachers not only adopt this mission, but they also adapt their teaching learning accordingly. What do they do? They, 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 they are given demanding tasks. They are given also challenging uh, curricula and so on and so forth for their improvement. And they also make sure that everybody across the board has the same level of academic achievement. And there are no divisions here and there. This is done consistently by upgrading also their teaching learning methods, their methods to assess and uh, discussions on classroom management, classroom climate, and so on and so forth. So uh, let me pause. Let me ask both of you if there is anything you want to talk about here. And one is talk talking about the clear mission, which is shared uh, between the principal and all the teachers. It is very clear. What you said is very clear. In fact, all right. Very... All right. OK, so we move on to the next objective, which is instructional leadership. Like I had mentioned that uh, when we are talking about instructional leadership, we are not talking about transformational, transformational leadership, because this is something which is a bit different. Instructional is more focused on creating the uh, core values uh, in the school, uh, which uh, make a teacher uh, uh, focus on the curriculum, uh, on the teaching methods and on the assessment, uh, assessment procedures with significant changes in classroom practice. Uh, so therefore, what happens is that they are also given a chance to uh, participate in the school's vision. What is the school's vision? It is uh, academic success for each and every child. When the teachers also gear their practices, when they adapt their practices, to this particular goal, then the school gives them a chance to participate in the vision of the school. So, so therefore, the principal is also the guide. He is the guide on the side. She is the guide on the side, you know. Uh, she is not the sole leader, but she is one of the leaders. It's important to, again, if I talk about uh, a democratic school, I'm not talking about a democratic classroom here, but about a democratic school, we will see that the teacher, the principal itself feels that he is not the sole, sole leader, but he is one amongst equal. Uh, uh, so basically what happens then, then is that everybody participates in, the, in furthering the school vision and uh, mission. Uh, there is uh, uh, the administrative uh, leadership and management is geared towards enhancing uh, this purpose, this objective. Uh, there is a curriculum, uh, you know, basically, which is shared amongst uh, teachers who teach the same classes, same uh, subjects. And there is also a shared decision making in this case. Uh, the, the responsibility for uh, teaching and success at teaching is not only of that particular teacher, but also of the principal, because he is also one amongst them. So this is an important thing. Then there is also the school gives adequate time uh, and opportunity for the teachers to learn. When they are being asked to uh, participate in uh, making every student worthy of acquiring skills and knowledge and uh, concepts, then uh, the school also ensures that there are ways and methods which the teachers are familiar with so that they can move ahead in this particular aim and objective. Uh, what happens? How does the principal help them? The principal helps them by seeing that there is a balance of issues between administrative tasks and curriculum uh, transaction. The teachers are not saddled with too much of administrative uh, task. You know, the curriculum, curricular demands, and uh, as far as the instruction time is concerned, there is a balance. There is significant amount of classroom time and instruction devoted to essential curricular areas. You know, uh, the students are actively involved in the whole process then uh, teaching learning takes place and so on. And especially for classes like the senior classes, 11 and 12, 
especially for uh, uh, subjects such as science subjects, English and mathematics subjects, the, the focus where the, normally research says that uh, you know, the this thing is very, uh, the academic achievement is low, more focus is uh, given over there. And the principal himself or her, herself also gets involved in devising the schedules and the uh, timetables in a manner that the children are able to do justice to the demands of these kind of subjects, you know. There is also a safe and uh, uh, orderly environment. Uh, you know, which is important. Uh, there is a business-like atmosphere, like I said, but it doesn't mean that, uh, 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 you know, basically that there is no fun and all, but the fun is linked to learning also. Uh, it is free from the threat of uh, uh, any kind of harm, either by the psychological harm, mental harm by the teacher or by the peers. There is also sometimes a lot of peer-to-peer -peer bullying going on and all that, you know, which me makes the school and the classroom not so much of a safe space. So that is also ensured. There is there are things like, uh, you know, there are positive ways of dealing with undesirable uh, behavior, and uh, then uh, there is cooperative team learning. Then there is an appreciation of human diversity because we are talking about inclusion these days and also about democratic values and how the teacher does that. If the teacher ensures that there is a mixing of groups, the, the ones who know more, who, who come from relatively back, better backgrounds, are kind of distributed amongst the other groups, you know. So um, already you are uh, teaching a practice which is democratic, which is acceptance of diversity. And uh, this is how you also teach democratic values to your children. Then important uh, thing is that there is also a positivity between the home and school uh, relation. Uh, the needs of the school actually uh, are fulfilled, uh, 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 the need of the school to serve and educate do not only stop with the child. They also kind of you know, trans transact to the community, to the society, and also to the entire family, in fact, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, th then the school organizes, apart from the parent-teacher meeting, uh, other events, you know, where the parents can come to school and see the value of education uh, for their children, how their uh, children learn, how their self-confidence has increased, how they are motivated towards coming to school and so on and so forth. So the school feels also happy in involving the parents because and in also kind of, you know, strengthening this parent uh, school bond because uh, then uh, both the school and the parents can help towards the uh, education of the children. Um, another important value is the frequent uh, monitoring of the student progress. Once the essential objectives have been laid down by the teacher, there is also a frequent uh, uh, monitoring of these essential uh, objectives. You know, uh, like I said, uh, assessment of uh, formative assessment which is should be data based is used to improve the individual student behavior and uh, performances and generally uh, spans across use of good teaching methods use of better teaching methods customizing your teaching learning to students needs and also to assessment and so forth uh, like that you know and there is also a shift away from the paper pencil multiple choice uh, tests with more kind of assess uh, you know focus on uh, products of students work like portfolios if you have been teaching a subject let us say a photosynthesis and you have asked the student to build a pro portfolio around photosynthesis uh, and put it in a file, you know. So instead of giving a test on the um, on photosynthesis, probably it's a better idea to uh, grade the portfolio. Similarly, there would be other aspects, you know, which are worth uh, maintaining a portfolio. And at the same time, yeah. So. Uh, 
so this is uh, what it is you know so if we uh, move away from uh, paper pencil test multiple choice questions we'll be able to introduce many more interesting uh, items you know uh, for assessment which the uh, children also will be happy with and also with the, the 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 teachers also will give gain more insights into uh, how learning takes place and all that you know uh i think uh, i'll probably stop here and because i'm going to be kind of you know closing the first uh, um, uh, course for you people and uh, there are just about a couple of uh, takeaways you know which I uh, would conclude with uh, one is the fact that uh, uh, while uh, we do talk about a list of things which the teacher has to do, uh, I feel that uh, the prime responsibility does not begin and end with the teacher herself or himself. The fact that uh, school as an ecosystem gives how much of an opportunity to the teacher to become better to become effective is also very important the role of the teacher here we cannot uh, of the principal we cannot discount uh, because the uh, principal is the school leader but her leadership also has to be like uh, that that uh, it should not be hierarchical it should not be based on the fact that she holds a position of power so she'll be able to kind of start disciplining the teacher herself you know that's something which uh, has one has to be careful about uh, the school has certain responsibilities like after having recruited its teachers the school has to empower the teachers with more uh, ways of uh, improving her performance and uh, with better ways of understanding the children, better ways of assessing the children, and so on and so forth. So school as an ecosystem, uh, the infrastructure, again, the responsibility of the uh, the the head teacher but at the same time responsibility of the teachers also to take care of but planning and doing things to move in a particular direction which is the direction in which the school has uh, formulated the vision and mission and articulated its goals both short-term goals and both long-term goals uh, it starts from the head teacher goes down to the uh, the teachers and also then finally of course to the students having said that we are also aware that the school system does uh, have certain limitations uh, in a lot of ways you know when one interacts with teachers whether in my country or teachers from abroad one finds that there is a kind of a uh, you know, a, a list of things which they feel they are not very satisfied with and which they would want to do, but the system does not allow them to do or the government does not give them funding and so on and so forth. So uh, during the interactions on these kind of uh, issues, one has come to the conclusion that uh, rather than waiting for things to happen outside or rather than waiting for thing change to take place from outside does the teacher have an autonomy to initiate certain things at her own end for instance um, if there are six or seven or eight uh, english teachers in my school and i'm also one of them is it possible for me to organize things like holding uh, a, a bi-weekly or a fortnightly seminar uh, you know, where I discuss um, the new uh, methods and techniques in teaching of English language. And similarly, if I am from the science background, is it possible that I get together a group of teachers, uh, 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 you know, who can sit together, who can discuss on the problems they are facing in the classroom, how these problems can, uh, you know, be overcome, how these challenges can be overcome. Things of this kind which do not uh, need too many resources, but at the same time, they do need 
motivation and they do do need some kind of initiative from the teachers and i'm talking about a situation where the head teacher probably uh, is not taking this initiative because uh, of a variety of reasons uh, but at the same time as a teacher if i can do that uh, take this kind of initiative with my own peer group then i think there is a scope for improving some of the things that we have been talking about we've been talking about a lot of issues we've been talking about how these can be implemented how certain action points come out of this but many a times going back to our situation we find it very difficult and just a second see mom teleconferencing me so many a times what happens is that uh, you know we are uh, we find at a loose end ourselves as at a loose end to take any initiative so my worry is that after having attended this particular program for all of you who have been giving good inputs valuable inputs into the discussions the takeaway should be that we will try to do things at our own end also for all of you who are uh, head teachers or aspiring to be head teachers obviously some action can start right away but for teachers uh, you know who are at the moment just teachers uh, you know one needs to think hard as to how this program is going to help us you know so that remains my concern and i would like you people to address this concern and also to think of that space available which does not require resources which does not require anybody else's intervention but where you can gain and improve your teaching learning practice with a bit of motivation and initiative so i think i'll stop here and if you uh, have any thing to supplement uh, this last few um uh, ideas that i have shared with i'll be happy to receive your feedback and then i think we'll close the session and i'll also say goodbye to you and i'll also wish you all the good luck uh you know and uh, i hope that this program uh, will eventually help you in kind of you know taking up some of the challenges which you be been discussing here and i also hope that this, this these discussions have been uh, quite useful uh, to you i do hope that sincerely so james can we have some quick comments from you and then probably wind up suleiman can i hear some comments and some opinions from you is anybody there before yes, i end here. yeah yeah okay okay good good so come up what do you what are your closing comments going to be like because i uh, did speak a lot on the takeaways you know so what do you think the takeaways are uh okay ma first of all we would like to thank you for all the times you have sacrificed for us uh we really appreciate all your efforts then we really uh thank you for giving us opportunity for joining this program so we thank you we thank you and uh we pray that made knowledge we acquired be beneficial to the entire uh, student and the all at large so thank you once again thank you very much for your observation and james is there anything you would like to say yes also i want to say thank you again for the wonderful time that you've been spending with us every wednesday um it's been it's been wonderful um, your your kind of presentation that you've been doing in fact i'm i'm, I'm going to adopt it with any online lessons that in future i get it makes you see that every learner is online and everyone is paying critical attention so thank you very much for such kind of presentation that you've been doing with all of us um i would just recommend that um in our next phase 
looks like the timing for Wednesday is becoming difficult for most of our colleagues. Sometimes it's very difficult to get all of us online on Wednesday, but in other days, you could see all of us there online, even before time and after time, we are still online. So um, we'll see if it's possible that we can arrange for the time to be um, a little bit, not if not favorable, be conducive for all of us, including our lectures, yourself. So thank you. Thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation to this semester. So do thank you. Very yes, much. yes, yes. <laughs> My even us, we managed to stay because uh, it is very difficult for all of us to be present on Wednesday. So that's why we just managed to stay in order not to okay. all of us okay. be absent. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'll just say this, that probably, you know, uh, towards the end of your uh, program, you would have a feedback session. You know, the regional center will have a feedback session with you. You can talk about Wednesdays. You can talk about the timings. You can also you can talk about Wednesdays. You can talk about the timings. You can also you can suggest, suggest other time, other time, 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 time for you. So you will see in our universe to adapt to your app to your. App to your I think Dr. Prashad uh, is uh, is your uh, coordinator from the regional center Dehradun. And when he does the feedback, please do mention to him all these difficulties and problems. OK, so I so think I, I will also just take uh, leave now. And I think you I, I must appreciate your participation. And the fact that despite your other schedules and all, you've been kind of, you know, attending these uh, sessions. These have been long sessions. Three to five is quite a bit of time. And uh, you've been wonderful students. I think whoever has attended has participated and which is like very heartening uh, for us as teachers to know. And uh, so all the best to you and do give your feedback. And uh, another thing, if you people come to India and to Delhi, you must come and visit uh, IGNU, which is now your university. You are students of the Indira Gandhi National Open University. And um, you are most welcome to come to, to the university and visit the university whenever in India and in Delhi. OK, so I so think, I... Uh, yeah. James, is there anything you want to say or we just close? close. I was saying that um, we would love to visit anytime. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yes. So, uh, do look forward to new people in Delhi and uh, you can always contact any one of us. You can contact me also. We'll be too happy to take you around. All right. So, all the best to you. All the best in whatever you uh, propose to do in the coming future and uh, uh, had good time with you all also. So thank you so much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. OK, bye. Thank you too. Bye bye. Dehradun. Hello. Dehradun. I'm... Hanji, you close it. Okay, I'm going to close it. Thank you. अच्छा एक मुझे सिर्फ कहना है कि इनको ये लोग ना फीडबैक भी देना चाहते हैं आ, एक मिनट फीडबैक यस यस मैम आप कुछ कह रहे हैं हां मैं कह रही थी कि